Hello, and welcome to the Student Achievement Partners monthly webinar. We'll be getting started in just a moment. But while you're waiting, go ahead and check the resources widget on your screen to see the resources that will go along with this evening's session. And also feel free to introduce yourself in the group chat, which a number of you have already started doing. Uh, the group chat is the icon at the bottom of your screen that looks like text bubbles. And we'll get started in just a moment. Welcome to our monthly core advocates webinar, Math Language Routines, Vibrant Discussions in the Math Classroom. I'm Lisa Goldschmidt, the Executive Vice President of our Tools and Classroom Resources team, and I'm delighted to be co-hosting this evening with my colleague Barbara Besky, Senior Math Specialist at Student Achievement Partners. In addition to the two of us, we are incredibly fortunate tonight to have five fantastic presenters, Renee Skerin, Jack Diekman, Anne Agostinelli, Chrissy Newell, and Karina Calderon. Before we get started with tonight's session, we'd like to just learn a little bit more about our audience with a quick poll. So take a moment and let us know uh, how many core advocates webinars you've attended in the past. I'll just have this up for one second, give everyone a chance to put in a response. Wow, we have a lot of new people here this evening. That is very exciting for us. We always like to have uh, new folks joining us and helping us to figure out what content uh, they really want. So that's wonderful. Welcome. For those of you who may not be familiar on the call, our Core Advocate Network is a national network of educators who are engaged in the work of supporting students and teachers with the transition towards a college and career-ready education. We'd like to invite all of you to join our network. The first step in doing that is filling out a survey with the link at the top of the screen. And we'll present this a few different times throughout the webinar so that you continue to have chances to sign up. If you'd like to learn more about us, you can also reach out to our colleague, Jenny Beltramini. Her email address is on the screen. You can, again, complete our survey or visit our website at chiefsacore.org for free tools and resources and for more information and opportunities about the network. This evening, we hope that you will consider uh, tweeting using the hashtag Core Advocates, either with Achieve the Core or any of our esteemed presenters. Uh, there's a tweet button at the bottom of the screen, which you can use to do that. And finally, I just wanted to give you a little tour of uh, what's in front of you on the screen so that you can interact with us during the webinar and so that you know what's coming afterwards. Uh, as many of you have already discovered, there's a group chat function. Again, it's the two chat bubbles at the bottom. It allows you all to speak to each other. There is a questions option down, uh, it should be around the middle of the screen where you can submit a question to us and to the presenters. We hope you'll use this throughout the presentation. We've left some time at the end to answer some of the questions that come up throughout the presentation. And we will also try to follow up with as many as possible uh, afterwards if we don't have a chance to get, that, get to them tonight. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, there's the resources tab that has resources related to tonight's session. After the webinar, within 24 hours, you'll receive a link to a uh, recording of the session. And in about two weeks, you'll receive an email from us with just a very short survey. We're just interested in finding out what you did once you left the webinar with the information you received this evening. Uh, once you complete the survey, you will receive a certificate uh, for an hour of professional learning time. And now, without further ado, Barbara's going to kick off our topic for the evening. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to have you all here this evening. I just want to share some of the goals of the webinar tonight. Um, first, we're going to learn what the math language routines are. Uh, Lisa shared with you uh, the resource folder in there. If you haven't already looked, you can find a really nice resource that speaks to each of the math language routines uh, with links to further information for each of them. 
Um, we hope to understand and learn more about the history of the routine. We're really fortunate to have two of our presenters um, who were on the writing team of the routine at Stanford's Understanding Language Project. We have another goal of discovering how math language routines can support math instruction for all students, especially English language learners. Um, we're going to hear from teachers and instructional coaches on how they've seen and used uh, math language routines in the classroom. And you're going to be able to identify practical strategies for implementing routines in your classroom. I recently heard Harold Storius uh, share the power of language um, in a classroom and thinking about language in a classroom um, as a tool for thinking and learning math, not just as a lever to communicate math. So in other words, language, listening, speaking, writing, and math um, is a tool for students to better understand the math, not just for a tool for students to communicate what they know. Um, and that really, uh, I thought was quite powerful. So I'd like to introduce you to our first speakers, uh, Renee Skarin and Jack Diekman. Uh, Renee and Jack were co-authors co of the principles for the design of math Curriculum, Promoting Language and Content at Understanding Language, a Research Center at Stanford University Graduate School of Education. Renee is the Director of Curriculum Review Process at ELSF, um, the English Language Success Forum, and previously she worked at Stanford's Understanding Language as a researcher, teacher educator, and curriculum designer. Uh, she began her career as a teacher of ELLs at the high school and college levels. Jack is currently the director of research at U-Cubed at Stanford. He began his career as a high school math teacher in Texas, where he worked with many multilingual learners. His research centers around the development of language for mathematical purposes. He consults internationally on math teaching and learning. Um, he also teaches at the Stanford Teacher Education Program. So we're thrilled to have them here, and I will pass the mic to them. Hello, good evening to everyone. Uh, this is Jack and um, Renee is joining me as well. And we're gonna be co-presenting with you on kind of the backstory of the mathematical language routine. Um, and Renee and I are gonna do this kind of interactively. So uh, she comes up with a comment, she'll chime in and I'll chime in as well. Uh, we want to kind of just start with what gave rise to the language routines. It was really a collaboration um, between Understanding Language, the center that we were working with and for, and a content developer who was developing in math who really wanted to find a way to have the English language learner supports, not just as an afterthought, not just as a note in the margin, but as something that could be integrated into the very DNA of materials. And this is a really interesting uh, challenge for us because at the center at Understanding Language, we had content specialists and we had language specialists. And for us, this represented a, a wonderful opportunity for us to, to collaborate and to um, generate new knowledge. I would be remiss if I didn't also recognize my co-authors, uh, Jeff Swears, Sarah rutherford Quack, Vincy Darrow, Steve Weiss and uh, Jim Malamet, who all contribute to, uh, to the, the design of this document. Um, we want to talk about, you know, what was new about the MLRs? What, what, what do we think we're contributing that wasn't there before? And for many of you and the audience who's worked in math education for a long time, you know, one of the problems we've had is that we've inherited or we've, um, a lot of English specialists, language specialists, have given us sort of ESL strategies to embed in mathematics. And many of us have tried, but sometimes the strategies were so generic, we couldn't quite figure out how to implement them uh, you know, in a way that was really effective, in a way that really developed both conceptual understanding and language development. Um, and I know this was my experience as well when I was a classroom teacher. I went to all the workshops on ESL and math, and I tried to understand as best I could, but to me there was always a disconnect. And so this team got together and tried to take that on as a challenge, to think about what are the math-specific features of academic language? What are the things we do in math that are specific in particular that um, we need support 
for English language learners. And I think the other part that was, so for example, um, there was, you know, think pair share. That's been around forever. And many of us have tried it. But in mathematics, it's not always clear what they're supposed to be learning, what students are supposed to be learning when they're thinking and when they're talking to each other. So um, part of it is because math language teachers, or I should say mathematics teachers, don't always have the full range of understanding of how language is developed. And so I've spent a good part of my career really trying to understand how language develops. And one of the sort of design uh, considerations that we put into this is how do we both support simultaneously language and content together because we think that there's an interdependency there. Um, I will um, let Renee talk about the process that we use to actually develop the MLRs. Thanks, Jack. Um, so once we formed our math and English language development expert team, um, we got to work figuring out how to support language development in the math area. Um, we knew we needed to start out creating some kind of theory of action or framework that would ground our work. So collaboratively, we designed a theory of, a theory of action reflective of four assumptions. One of them Jack already talked about, which is the interdependency of language learning and content learning. Um, the second one was the central role of student agency in mathematical sense making and language learning. So really helping students to take um, charge of their own mathematical learning. Um, the third is the importance of strategic and contingent scaffolding. So this is scaffolding that fosters student participation, but also reflects their needs in the moment, or what we call instructional responsiveness um, in the teaching process. So that's a lot to work into, you know, a, a set of uh, a set of mathematical language routines that could be supportive of a math curriculum, could be supportive of English learners in a math curriculum. So we decided then to develop four design principles that were reflective of those assumptions and that would undergird any of the routines that we designed or utilized for the curriculum. So we started out, the first one was support sense making. We needed routines that help students to make sense of the language, the skills, and the math we were asking them to use. Um, so this means amplifying the language rather than simplifying the language. Um, and we really believe in the amplification of language because we believe that a that students really need to have opportunities to um, engage with sophisticated ideas, with sophisticated language, um, and not to dumb down the language because if they're if they don't have exposure to it uh, later on, they're going to be uh, in trouble. Um, and then the uh, next one was optimize output, and these are routines and activities that should help students to get better and better at expressing their mathematical thinking in writing and speaking about math. And then the third one was cultivate conversation, and these uh, should be routines which help students to have that back and forth interaction, which are really rich and which help students to fill in gaps in their knowledge. Um, it also gives them real reasons for speaking. It gives them a sort of low stakes way for them to strengthen their thinking and language use. And then the last one is maximize meta awareness. So these are uh, routines that should help students to organize their thinking, apply them, uh, their thinking across contexts, reflecting on, reflect on their expanding use of math language. And then we got into the crafting and adapting routines, which reflected all of these principles. And that's what you see in the MLRs. Uh, we believe these routines will really help students to develop math content and language, to help them build on ideas, help teachers to help students as they contingently respond to, to student needs. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, Jack, did you want to go ahead and take that? Yeah, sure. I can take this one. So uh, 
we have all these routines, and the question was, how do we thoughtfully put them into the curriculum? And I think that's the same challenge that districts and teachers and curriculum committees are also thinking about. If you look at each of the routines, each of them makes sense, but how do we thoughtfully integrate them? And so here was our process. We looked at a unit. We thought, what's the main content of the unit? Try to understand that first. That was the driver. And then within that content, what are the implicit language demands? What are we expecting kids to do, to show, to understand, to explain, to justify? What are all the language functions embedded in there? Um, and then within those, what supports are already in place? And what are opportunities that we have to develop language that we can then um, use a math routine? Um, and we kept asking ourselves, when we put in this routine, does it directly support content? And can it be used in other topics? In other words, was it more generalizable? This was kind of our filter for trying to figure out um, how to use a math routine. So these questions, this process, I think, might be useful for districts as you consider embedding and integrating these routines into your language, into your curriculum. And we're going to hear from some teachers who actually did this. And I'd be curious to hear if they use a similar process or, or how they, um, what their thought process was in choosing the MLRs. We also, we've had some experience in using MLRs in professional learning. And so for those of you who are professional developers, one of the models that we've done here in California that I think has been extremely successful, um, and this is work that I also did with uh, Harold Estudio, is um, at the county level, we got teachers and coaches together for two days. And the first day, we gave them an overview of the document and all the language routines and we modeled a few of them and they looked through the logic and we sort of explained how they might implement it in the classrooms. And then each teacher chose one of those to implement, one MLR that they committed to actually implement into their classroom and document. So that in day two, they brought back the classroom artifacts, the language samples, they analyzed them together. They tried to really make sense of that. And so we felt like this is one you know, possible model for deepening teachers' understanding, applying the, the routines in their own practice, and then coming back and reflecting. So we were able to do this in two days. So we offer this as just a, as a model for those of you that are um, responsible for professional learning. And then Renee? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, at the English Learner Success Forum where I work, we've developed a set of guidelines to support um, the development of uh, mathematical uh, materials, learning materials. Um, and in that set of guidelines, we believe in the math language routines so much that we've embedded them in our own um, uh, areas of focus uh, in those guidelines. So if you uh, care to visit our website um, uh, at the English Learner Success Forum, you can find those guidelines and you can find how they are applied um, in these di different uh, areas of focus. Um, and then I'll turn it back over to Jack um, to talk about national conversations. So just to wrap up our, you know, sort of backstory part, we think about what are we adding to this idea, uh, you know, of English language learners. Some of you may have already been working with English language learners for a long time, but for many people, especially in the math area, this may be sort of new information. So we feel like we're contributing that it's possible to design curriculum that takes into account language variability, not as an afterthought, but as a given. That in any classroom, there's going to be a range of language proficiencies. And I don't mean just academic, just English or another language, but I mean even in academic English. There's always going to be a range. So how do we plan for that range? I think that's what we're adding to the conversation. The second part is that um, disciplinary language supports are not just for a, a certain population of kids, but that they actually help all learners, including English learners. And then finally, I think what we're doing, both at Understanding Language, at ELSF, and many other places, we're trying to develop training tools and resources that are available to help build that capacity on, among the districts. And this webinar and what we're going to hear tonight of the teachers' experiences is exactly one of those. So um, I thank you guys for listening for the first part, and I'll hand it over to uh, Barbara.
or Lisa. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jack and Renee. Um, our next presenter is Anne Agostinelli, middle school math teacher from Chicago, Illinois. So Anne learned about the MLRs last year while she was implementing illustrative mathematics in eighth grade. She teaches in a school with over 80% emergent bilingual students and finds that the MLRs have been invaluable to her instruction. And so she was really eager to share her experiences this evening and is going to speak about the stronger and clearer MLR. So take it away, Anne. Thank you, Lisa. I'm really happy to follow our author's introduction. And I, as I was listening, I really found that what Jack mentioned about these math language routines being really embedded in the content is very true. They sit well and they lend themselves to making language a part of the mathematical learning process. And as Renee mentioned, they also help to amplify the language. We know as classroom teachers how to support our students to kind of get them through as they're learning the mathematics. But then many of those supports disappear when the high stakes tests come around um, and those assessments are administered. So the math language routines, what I really love about them is that they maintain the rigor of the language that's in these problems so that students are practicing in class what they will see on those assessment measures. Um, so that has been something that's really been beneficial for me, and I was glad to hear Jack and Renee you know, talk a little bit about that. Um, before I get into this routine of stronger and clearer each time, I just want to share a bit about how I've gotten started with using the MLRs. Uh, my school, as Lisa mentioned, adopted illustrative mathematics last year, and I was teaching eighth grade. That was the first place that I had learned about them and seen the research from Stanford was um, summer of 2018 when I went to a professional development session for illustrative math. Um, so I, you know, I read through them. I was, my interest was piqued. Um, and then, of course, the beginning of the school year started, and um, I was getting busy with that, getting, you know, getting everything in place. So in first quarter of last year, I reached out to the literacy coach in my building, um, who was actually really excited to hear from a math teacher, and she worked with me to develop the protocols with my students. And what I've learned from this um, has led me to these two pieces of advice. The first is that, as Jack kind of alluded to, I found that really choosing one strategy at a time to really refine and get into worked best for me and for my students. I actually started last year with the three reads strategy and spent the rest of first quarter and a lot of second quarter just refining that and getting that to a place where my students and I used it productively. Then we uh, added in stronger and clearer each time, which is the routine I'm going to talk about tonight. Those were my focus areas all of last year. So I chose two of the routines and spent a whole school year really getting good at those. And then I'm working this year to add on um, an additional routine or two. But that time for me and for my students to practice and to reflect and to refine what we were doing was really uh, essential for making this successful. Um, and then my second piece of advice is to never skip the reflection. So when you go through and use a math language routine with your students, making sure at the beginning it would take us a whole class period and we would, you know, spend a lot of time on each part because it was teaching a new routine. But I always made sure that I left at least five to ten minutes at the end for us to really reflect and think about how much they impacted our work that day, that using these language routines really improved our mathematical thinking and um, the way that we were able to express ourselves. So all of that being said, I'm going to focus in tonight on stronger and clearer each time, which is one of the math language routines. So the goal of this routine is to help students revisit and refine their thinking to develop and present a more well-developed idea, either in response to a prompt as a solution to a problem or any other opportunity for communication where precision is a focus. So we talk a lot about um, standard for mathematical practice three and really critiquing others' reasonings and being good listeners and being able to articulate our thinking. And then of course, SMP six with attending to precision. 
And I find that this routine really speaks to both of those. It also provides a chance for participants to reflect on how communication strengthens our thinking when we learn from others. So it's building community. It's helping kids to see that um, collaboration and communication are really important parts of learning mathematics. They're not separate. So the process that um, we follow, it begins with independent think time. So students just work on their own. They have some time to think and write in response to whatever prompt or question or problem has been posed. And I typically sent, set a, an amount of time for them to just write everything you can about blank, whatever the prompt was that day. So they have some silent think time, they're writing. I encourage them to use drawings, diagrams, words, and phrases, anything that they can get down that helps to convey their thinking. Before the students move on to the next part, I have them pause and read what they have written and jot down just three to four key words from it to remind them what they want to share with their partner. So they've had these few minutes to write. Now let's pause, reread what you wrote and get ready because now you're going to go um, get to talk to other people and share your thinking. So once they finish that initial draft and taken those few key words to share, then they get to go through two or three rounds of collaboration. These rounds of collaboration I try to structure in different ways. Um, sometimes we'll do a stand up, hand up, pair up. So I'll have everybody stand up. I'll either play some music or I'll set a timer and they just rotate throughout the room put a hand up and give a high five to the closest person when I call time. That's their first partner. They spend a couple of minutes with this partner to share their thinking and to get feedback on their thinking from that partner and then to switch. So at the end of each pairing, um, they've heard from another person and then they've been able to share their own thinking and get feedback. Once the time is up for that first pair up, they take a moment jot down something new that they heard from their partner. So some new idea, new term, new illustration, new example, new something that they heard from their partner. And then we do that one or two more times. So they get to find another partner, go through the same process, find a third partner, and go through the same process again. When they get to their last partner, um, I like for them to uh, make sure that they thank each other and reinforce social skills in the midst of this. So we use sentence stems or closing statements that they choose from, and then they just high five each other before heading back to their seats. When they get back to their seats, they are able to um, have some more quiet think time, and they jot down a revised draft. So they have their initial draft there. They also have written down ideas they heard from other people and now it's time for them to revise the draft of their thinking. So once they write down, I give them again, I set a timer, give them a little time for that. And then um, we do the piece of reflecting. So we reflect on the process. So I'm gonna show an example on this next slide and kind of tell you more about that reflection piece because as I said at the beginning, it's really important. So you can see this first one was just a vocabulary thing. The kids had come back from a weekend um, and we were studying uh, probability and we had shifted to theoretical probability. And so they had gotten really comfortable with experimental and theoretical was a little bit um, open-ended for some kids still. So you can see on the left that that initial draft at the top, that student just drew a picture, remembered some spinners, remembered how to find the theoretical probability using spinners. And then at the bottom is that same student's revised draft. So one of the things that I love was when we pause for the reflection at the end, they look at their initial draft and their revised draft. And this student, and the reason I chose this student's work, said, wow, I knew way more than when I wrote it down at first after I got to talk to people. And it was as if I had paid her to write an endorsement for this talk. Um, but it also just showed that importance and that, that way that they are able to communicate. On the right is what they jotted down in the meantime. So at the very top, it says me, and that was the few words that the student wrote down before they went to talk to partners. Then the three other boxes that are below it, they just show what they learned from a new partner. So 
from her second partner, she was able to uh, remember to use the word probability and talk about outcomes. And then as it went down, you can see that that student was able to build on and make that final draft. So letting them see how much they've grown in this short little routine is a really powerful way for them to value what's happening in the classroom. Um, just quickly, a couple other ways that I've used this. This is a problem that was actually from my illustrative math curriculum last year, and it is another vocabulary um, example. And it's focused on the eighth grade curriculum. They were working on rigid transformations and developing some of the language, the academic vocabulary, for that unit. And so using this routine was um, a way for them to get to hear from other people and revise their own responses to describing how you get from uh, frame one to frame two, two to three, and so forth. You can also use stronger and clearer each time with problem solving. So this is an example from Would You Rather Math? And um, students have done problems similar to this where they take some time and that individual think time at the beginning, they're actually just writing um, their response, their solution to this problem. So instead of writing about what is theoretical probability, they're solving a problem, they're showing their work, they're explaining their thinking, they go through the same protocol. They get to see other people, talk to them, um, and figure out how they can strengthen their own response. And then last, um, one other way that I've used it is to introduce a new instructional routine. So when I started using um, which one doesn't belong with my eighth graders this year, um, they used the stronger and clearer each time protocol to help them realize how much we can learn from each other using a which one doesn't belong. So for anyone who may not be familiar with this, um, the goal is to find a reason why each of the quadrants doesn't belong with the rest. So kids were able to find um, things that were in common, but also the things that made them different. And so the communication piece was important, and it also just built that culture of valuing each other's ideas. So I know that was a lot in a short amount of time. Um, feel free to tweet me if you want to continue the conversation. Um, but there are a lot of ways to use this routine. And again, my advice is to start small and to never skip the reflection. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. That was wonderful. Um, we have a jam-packed agenda this evening, so I'm going to move us along to two more fantastic presenters who are very eager to share their experiences using MLRs. Unfortunately, they weren't able to join us live this evening, but both were so enthusiastic about uh, joining that they submitted recordings of um, explaining their work in schools to date. So we're going to share those with you now. Up next, we're going to hear from Chrissy Newell, the math project coordinator uh, from Turlock, California. Uh, Chrissy asked that we start with this poll to get everyone in the right headset. So please take a moment and uh, respond to the poll. The prompt is, I'm most likely to ask questions when I. Chrissy is going to be speaking about the information gap MLR. So as you're listening to her next part, keep in mind the answer you gave and just take a look at some of the other responses that are common among uh, participants this evening. Hello, my name is Chrissy Newell, and I'm the Math Project Coordinator from Stanis County Office of Education, which is in Central California. And in my role, I get to support 25 districts improve their mathematics teaching and learning. So I get to work with different teachers and administrators and students every week. I've been in this role now for six years and prior to this, I was a fifth and sixth grade teacher. So I started working with the math language routines 
as they were written into a curriculum that I was delivering professional learning around. And I was struck by how different the math language routines felt as a support for ELs compared to the previous supports I had provided to me as a classroom teacher. And I'm talking about the little boxes in my curriculum that basically said things like front load vocabulary or have students explain. And while those strategies can provide some support, the math language routines to me are so much more intentional about supporting math content and math language side by side. And I think the intentionality is really the most important idea here that math language routines help both teachers and students focus intentionally on language as much as possible through teacher actions and activity structures. And they give us routines for not just inviting students to talk to each other, but also support for making those conversations productive. So through the use in math, of math language routines in classrooms, I have started to see students who are not afraid to get started, even if they have incomplete understandings. I've seen students who are really starting to see their peers as having good mathematical ideas and students who are willing to revise their thinking to make their ideas more clear. And tonight I'm gonna to focus on talking about information gap, one of my favorite math language routines. And I wanna kind of refer back to the question I started with in the poll which was thinking about when you're most likely to ask questions. And it might've been really hard to just choose one of those options, but as I'm looking at those options, you know, I'm most likely to ask questions when I am trying to solve a problem, when I'm trying to find out missing information and when I'm curious about something, when I fully don't understand something, I'm very likely to ask questions. And then if I have a disagreement or I need a clarification, um, those are also conditions under which I may ask questions. So information gap gives us a structure to help students ask questions in order to gain information. And the main purpose behind information gap is basically to create a need for students to communicate. And in information gap, we do this by facilitating a meaningful interaction by giving partners or team members different pieces of information that have to be used together to solve a problem or to play a game. And with information gaps, students have to orally and then you know, or visually, depending on what you're using, um, share their ideas and information in order to bridge the gap and accomplish something they couldn't have done by themselves. And so as the teacher, we start this routine by really, really modeling and asking students for how you share information, how you ask for clarification or justification, how you seek elaboration on ideas. And so we're really, really focused in this routine on cultivating conversation. And for me, it comes back to what I said about questioning. When we engage students in discourse, it's not just about answering someone else's question, which is so often, you know, how we ask students to think with a partner, respond to this question I just asked. It also has to be about helping them build language to answer, you know, to pose their own questions as well. And I've used this routine in second through eighth grades to motivate students to talk to each other, to encourage productive conversation, and to help students make sense of problems in a context. So I'm gonna focus on information gap within a contextual problem. And again, this relates to not just cultivating conversation, which is an invitation to talk, but also optimizing output. So giving students a structure for how to productively respond. So we're gonna look at a fourth grade task, and this is from a fourth grade OA standard that's all about solving the dreaded multi-step word problems. And I know there are lots of strategies, some more or less effective for approaching a word problem. But with this task, um, we're really gonna think about how we get students to work together and use language to solve this problem. So this is the question I started with. And I'm gonna let you read it to yourself and then we'll move on.
Okay. So with this problem, I basically took it apart and pulled all of the information or data, sometimes it's called, out of the original problem. So that means all the numbers were pulled out. And you'll notice the important information and quantities are listed on the info card side that you see. On the problem card, we have sort of a skeleton of the problem we started with. We even have the question that that original problem posed as well. But one student is going to receive the problem card and the actual context, and the other student is gonna receive just the information that is needed to solve that problem. And I create info gaps really by, you know, you can really create one with any word problem and do you use exactly that approach. Take the problem, take out all the information and separate it so that we have kind of a, a skeleton context and then we have just the data or just the information. And it can be really helpful, but overwhelming to kind of talk students through how to approach an information gap. So I always have students read their own card to themselves. And then depending on what grade level we're in and what my students need, I will sometimes have students actually, as they're working together, read the problem card aloud. So they both have an, a, you know, a pulse on what the content context of the problem is. So basically we have students read their card and then they're going to go back and forth in a structured exchange to either receive or give information. So a partner with the info card asks, um, you, you know, what information do you need? And you patiently wait for your partner to ask for specific information. You go back and forth until the problem partner really feels like they have enough information to solve the problem. And at that point in the routine, I like to have students come together and lay those cards side by side and solve the problem together. And then talk about what was helpful in the exchange, what they had wished they had maybe done more effectively. Um, but really it's about teamwork. And I think one of the challenges of the routine can be when students think it's about um, positing um, each other against you know, being against each other. So I have the problem, you have the card, and we're competing for who's gonna solve the problem. But that's really not the frame we want them to take. We want them to understand that throughout this conversation, it's all about us using our questioning, using our information giving language in order to solve this problem together. And here you'll see an information gap poster that was in a fourth grade classroom. and. This offers some questions and some sentence stems for how this conversation goes kind of back and forth. And you'll notice the info card questions are on the left because generally the exchange starts with the in student with the info card um, asking a question. So I'm going to show you a fourth grade example of info gap, and then we'll kind of close our thinking about this routine. Cam sorts all his Lego wheels into three piles, small, medium, and large. How many vehicles do, does he build with all his wheels? What do you need to know? I need to know how many small wheels Cam has. Why do you need to know that? Because Cam sorts all his Lego wheels into three piles, small, medium, and large, and he builds vehicles with them, and I need to know how many vehicles he builds. I can tell you that Cam has four small wheels. What else do you need to know? I need to know how many medium wheel wheels Cam has. Why do you need to know that? Because I need to know how many wheels can, how many vehicles Cam has. I can tell you that Cam has twelve medium wheels. What do you? What else do you need to know? I need to know how many large wheels Cam has. Why do you need to know, know that? Because he built, because he built some Lego vehicles, and I need to know how many he built. I can tell you that Cam has eight large wheels. Do you have enough information to solve this problem? No. 
Aisha. Yes, I'm sure I do not. What else do you need to know? I need to know how much wheels he, use, he uses to make bikes. How do you know he uses them to make bikes? Because it says vehicles, not cars. I can tell you that Kev uses half of his wheels to build motorcycles and half of his wheels to build cars. So. I would add them to this too. No, do it right. Fourteen. Okay, I got twenty-four. Yeah, me too. Okay, 24, and 24 divided, divided by, by 2, two equals, equals 12. And then 12 divided by 2, because there are two wheels on a motorcycle. Yeah. 12 so that would be 6. Divided by 2 equals 6. And so that means he has 6 motorcycles. And then. 12 divi divided by 4, I'm doing 12 divided by 4 because there are 4 wheels on a car. Okay. And that would be 3. So, three. and 3 cars. And th yeah, 3 plus 6 three, equals yeah. 9. Equals 9. And Cam has 9 vehicles. As you're finishing watching that episode of Info Gap with fourth graders, I wanted to close with just a couple of thoughts. The first one was just to make you aware that that was actually only the second time that those students had engaged in an Info Gap just one on one with another student. When I first launch the routine, I always do it. Um, with the entire class and I will be the holder of the problem card and have students be the holder of the data card. And we practice questioning in that way before I release them to do it with a partner. So I'm curious how you think, how you're thinking about using information gap in your own context to both build language and also authentic collaboration opportunities. And I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, you can tweet me at Mrs. Newell 22, um, and I hope that you are able to take some of these ideas and implement them in your own classroom. Thank you so much for having me. Our final presenter of the evening is Karina Calderon, a two-way immersion fifth grade teacher from Lake Forest, California. Karina is going to be discussing her work with the Collect and Display MLR. One more video clip. Hi everyone, my name is Karina Calderon. I am a fifth grade two-way immersion teacher in Lake Forest, California. I'm excited to share the success I've had with using math language routines in my classroom. Today, I will be talking about the math language routine collect and display. The purpose of collect and display is to capture students' oral words into a collective reference. This collective reference is different to anchor charts and vocabulary walls as it is entirely created by students. As a teacher, your role is to listen intently and scribe the language students use during partner, small group, or whole class discussions. This allows students' own input to be used as a reference in developing mathematical language. These charts capture the in-moment language and thought process of your students. The collect and display charts are kept throughout the unit so that the teacher and students can continuously reference. The language captured in this math language routine can be referenced, updated, and revised as students' thinking changes and expands. Mathematical Practice 3 
focuses on students being able to construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. The collect and display routine cultivates a classroom where student talk is valued and students are attending to this mathematical practice. I have used this routine of collect and display in hopes of promoting student agency and voice in my classroom. I want my students to feel like their voice and their thinking is valuable for their peers. By establishing this routine in my classroom, students feel valued for their ideas and thinking. As you take a step back in your teacher role and listen intently to the conversations occurring in your class, you are allowing students to construct arguments and critique the reasoning of others. As you display the mathematical language occurring within these partner or small group conversations, you are inviting all students to be a part of their peers' thinking and reasoning. In fifth grade, I typically use the collect and display math language routine to capture my students' thinking during our math talks. As I launch a math talk, I take a step back as a teacher and really listen to my students' conversations. I take notes of what I want to capture from these students' conversations to the whole class. This is an example of a number string math talk with the reasoning of students. As I listened to partner conversations, I noted language such as multiplication equations and multiplication expressions. Students naturally made connections to inverse operations as they worked to mentally solve these division equations. This is something I wanted all students to capture. As we worked through the second division equation, the language of you add another zero came up. This was also something I wanted to display because it is a common misconception when working with powers of 10. Another student chimed in to this conversation saying that you don't add another zero because two plus zero does not equal 20. In addition to this student's comment, adding another zero, but better yet, it is increasing by 10 times greater. By displaying one student's thinking, the reasoning of their peers was able to come to light in a manner that benefited all students. This second example of collect and display captures my students' thinking as we explored models and the relationship of expressions. As we looked at the model, students thought of efficient strategies to finding the total amount of squares. The language that students use to describe their efficient strategy of seeing the model included groups, columns, rows, squares, and rectangles. When challenged to think about describing their peers' thoughts in a form of expression, students quickly drew connections to their understanding of expressions and operations. My students love sharing their ideas. With the continuous use of collect and display, they often refer back to each other's thinking, draw connection, and see multiple ways of approaching a problem. The benefit of using the collect and display routine is that you always have something for students to reference. This is why it's important to do this routine on chart paper as opposed to whiteboard to avoid erasure. Another benefit of this routine is the increase in engagement and participation from all students. I've used this routine periodically with the goal of increasing student voice and it works perfectly. I hope you get a chance to implement this in your classroom as well. Hi, this is Barbara again, and uh, we have a few minutes left to um, uh, have a few of your questions answered. So the first one is going to go to Renee. Renee, um, a few people asked a question about um, we've used the phrase amplify the language a few times tonight, and I was just wondering if you could share a little bit more about what it means uh, when we say amplify the language. Yeah, sure. Um, amplifying the language just means finding a way to express 
express the language in a different way so that students have access to the meaning. So it could be through showing a picture, it could be through an, uh, visual gestures, it could be providing a student-friendly definition, um, anything that will help to kind of, um, uh, for the student to flesh out the meaning of, of more uh, sophisticated or complicated language. Awesome. Thanks so much. And Anne, uh, a question, a few questions came in for you around stronger and clearer. Uh, one, um, folks would like to know how long does that typically take? Um, and if you could also put a plug in for what's been your favorite routine that you've used with your students so far. Sure. Um, so how long it takes um, varies over time. So initially, it takes a long time. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, I spent nearly an entire period on it the first time just because of all the modeling and reflection that was built in throughout and sharing after each step so that kids really understood the routine and the purpose and got to understand it. But once we get practiced at it, if we do a full um, stronger and clearer with like three rounds of collaboration, um, each, each partner talk is only a couple minutes. So we can do the whole thing in about 20 minutes. Um, if we really want to, you know, do it well. Um, and my favorite is Stronger and Clearer. Um, that's my favorite routine so far. Um, I love it because my students love it, but also I really like that I'm able to incorporate the listening and speaking and movement um, all in one routine. And I also really like that the kids see their growth in such a short amount of time. They really feel good about themselves when they're done um, you know, with their uh, revised draft because they're like, whoa, I really have already improved and I just had to talk to three other people to do that. Fantastic. Thanks, Anne. Um, so as Lisa mentioned earlier, we will be going through your questions um, and uh, hopefully getting some answers to you uh, through email. Um, and uh, again, thanks so much for participating. Lisa, back to you. Thank you, and thanks to our incredible presenters tonight and for, to all of you for your patience to work through some of the technical difficulties. Just a quick final plug to join the Core Advocates Network and uh, help us to grow the network so we can better support educators and get you the tools and resources that you need. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Pinterest, and we hope you will for more live updates and uh, resource updates and ways to connect with other educators across the country. And finally, we hope you'll join us again next month for our next webinar, Supporting Excellent and Equitable Foundational Skills Instruction with the Foundational Skills Observation Tool. The registration link is here, and it will be uh, mailed out as it typically is if you join our email subscriber list. And thank you as always, and we hope you have a wonderful evening.